thank you, Ranan, and thank you very much to the organizer for inviting me for a very challenging talk because to make a link between what we heard already and especially from the last speaker and the fascinating world of uh, microbiota. And I would like to present to you some insights, some new insights in the field. And my talk will be divided in four parts regarding the first point, which is something new, the programming, the dysbiosis, the microbiota and feeding, and finally, how to modulate the microbiota. Uh, the first point is very important since the last uh, decades. Indeed, there is no longer uh, consideration for this view of the microbiota or microflora that was the wording previously. Indeed, it represents only 30% of the bacteria in our gut because they are culturable. And since the onset of metagenomic and one of the first work from the meta Network program published in Nature in March 2010, the view on intestinal microbiota, our common cell flora, did change. And today we have to consider uh, the following. There are three dominant phyla, and uh, the largest one is probably the bacteroidetes, the second one is actinotobacteria, and the third one is the uh, firmicutes. And you will see from this wording that it can uh, occur some change in this uh, phyla. And the second point to be considered is that the microbiota is representing more than 10 times, 10 times more uh, bacteria than we have cells in our body. The second point is that the total weight of the microbiota is overpassing the human brain. And the second is that the microbiota in our gut has a potential for uh, 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 genetics which is great and greater than our own potential. And for all this reason today, our view on microbiota is that it's more or less an organ. And it's an organ because it can be also transplanted and we will see which type of application we will have. The so it's the, an important point is that the microbiota change over aging. Indeed, the number of uh, species according to age is changing from birth, preterm babies, to the seniors, and the microbiota diversity is changing either. And the diversity with age is changing with greater proportion of bacteroides, distinct abundance of Clostridium groups, increased enterobacteria population and lower number of bifidobacteria, which is a very important bacterial species. And what is the reason? Maybe antibiotic use, low fiber diet, or any other factors. But probably one of the actors in this pathway is the short chain fatty acid change. We will go back to that. And if we go back now to the beginning of life. After birth, there is a bacterial colonization with implementation of the microbiota. And it's clear now that this colonization may be influenced by several factors. The term of pregnancy, the route of delivery, the hygiene of the neonatal environment, the ba maternal bacterial gut microbiota, the diet of the infant, and the use of drugs like antibiotics or PPA. Interestingly, if you look at this uh, cartoon, there is a repartition of uh, C delivery, cesarean delivery, in the world. And the winner is South Korea. Almost 40% of births are from C section. And not the loser, but I do consider the best in Netherlands is with 13.5 uh, delivery by C section. And Mexico, US, and uh, other countries are in the highest range of C-section. And if you look at the influence of C-section on the bacterial colonization, you may understand which type of consequence. And here on the left, in the blue, there is a C-section, and as you can see, it 
provide difference in the microbiota implementation. Whether this change, this difference are remaining over life, it's not clearly known, but it seems that it can last several years. And interestingly, there is a link between the C-section delivery and the occurrence of some disease, like diabetes type 1. And type 1 is related to immune disorder and autoimmune disease. There is no data showing today that there is a link between C-section and type 2 diabetes. But there is a recent study, or two years ago, published showing that the occurrence of obesity in a preschool children is influenced by the C-section. As you can see, the C-section in uh, red is uh, significantly more frequent in the C-section delivered baby. And even if you adjust on the BMI of the mother, the difference remain. One other factor is related to breastfeeding, and it's well known for many years that breastfeeding is influencing the gut microbiota. And if you compare with uh, breastfed and formula fed, there is difference, especially regarding the bifidobacteria. And uh, recently, it was shown that by comparing formula rich in protein and low content protein and breast milk, there is difference in the occurrence of overweight and obesity in uh, childhood. But the reason are protein or microbiota or both. And interestingly, in the paper, there is no real approach of the gut microbiota change according to the formula. And finally, the first message of my talk is regarding the difference that could occur from birth between children. Indeed, those are different immediately after birth according to the term, to the C-section, to the antibiotic or PPI use, and to the formula feeding. And it's clearly known that early change may have consequences for immune system development, metabolism, and health. And it's the reason I am allowed to talk about microbiotal programming as we know the metabolic programming, there is probably today to be considered the microbiotal programming. What is this biosis and occurrence of disease? The goal of this uh, implementation is to have the peace, the peace between the host and the commensal microbiota, and that provides homeostasy and physiological development. But sometimes, because of several factors, as mentioned before, it can have a loss of homeostasy. It's called dysbiosis. What is dysbiosis? Dysbiosis is the loss of equilibrium between protective and deleterious bacteria. And that can be caused by mode of delivery, unadapted feeding, acute gastroenteritis, antibiotic use or abuse, and PPI use. And there is clear evidence today that perturbation of intestinal microbiota by antibiotics or PPI are clearly established on epidemiological point of view. And there is also uh, studies focusing on the onset of inflammatory bowel disease in relation with antibiotic use, which is a very important issue. And if you look at some experimental model, and that is uh, Laura Cox work, and you can see that by receiving nothing or uh, 16 weeks or 20 weeks of antibiotics in the mouse model, there is change in the body composition and especially in male. That means that antibiotic microbiota and body composition might be related. And what is clearly established today are the perturbation of intestinal microbiota as a possible factor of disease. And you can see that it's recognized today that obesity and type 2 diabetes are on the list. And today, the view of the microbiota and the health and disease is very large, involving several organs and functions, like the adipose tissue, the liver with a NASH, non-fatty acid liver uh, disease, and the uh, atherosclerosis, pancreatic disease, etc. And of course, the GI tract. And we have to add 
the link between microbiota and allergic disease, IBD, motility disorder, and IBS, and probably many others. And to go in that direction, there is clear evidence for now several years from the meta-EAT studies that there is difference if you compare, sorry, if you compare the microbiota of ulcy control to Crohn's patient or ulcerative colitis patient, there is not the same microbiota. And especially in ulcerative colitis patient, there is a loss of diversity. And in obesity, there is change according to the degree of obesity as assessed by the BMI, which is clear that, again, microbiota and obesity and body composition are related. We will see why and how. And what is known for, again, many years that there is change according to the status, obese or non-obese, involving the proportion of firmicutes and bacteroidetes. And indeed, the uh, starvation make uh, the change. And we don't know exactly if change in microbiota make obesity or change in obesity make change in microbiota, which is a question. But interestingly, there are model and animal model, of course, of fecal transplantation. And you can have an obese mice, a mouse, which become thin, lean, and the contrary, just by changing the fecal microbiota. And there is today evidence that fecal transplantation with obese mice, faces into lean germ-free mice, render 20% increase in visceral fat compared to uh, the, the, the baseline. And just after two weeks of uh, uh, transplantation, which is absolutely fascinating to be able to transfer through the microbiota a metabolic disorder. And now there is a body of evidence from several papers published in very, very prestigious review like Nature, suggesting a link between microbiota and uh, metabolic disease. And indeed, it was shown uh, by Carlson that in obese, there is a reduced short and fatty acid butyrate producer and uh, a decrease in Roseburia species and also the famous Fecalibacterium protsniti, which is also involved in Crohn's disease, interestingly. And there is, uh, an, uh, uh, on by the enrichment by using Lactobacillus gasseri and Streptococcus mutans in sample as predictive value for developing insulin resistance. But uh, there is also predictive value of the microbiota. And indeed, that is to show you that by stratifying the, uh, according to the glucose tolerance, there is predictive value, and that is normal glucose tolerance, and that is type 2 diabetes. And in uh, the triglyceride level and C-peptide, and that is representing the microbiota. That means change in microbiota are predictive of the onset of type 2 diabetes. And moreover, it's very interesting to see that, again, by transplanting feces, you may change the profile in terms of peripheral insulin sensitivity. And again, by performing allogenic gut microbiota infusion, according to autologous gut microbiota infusion, you have changed here, but not here, obviously. And the same on hepatic insulin sensitivity which is really fascinating, transplanting the feces and improving the metabolic status. Our uh, microbiota is also influenced, certainly by feeding. And there is a, a, a lot, a lot of paper suggesting this link according to the geographical localization. The feeding is not the same in Africa or in South America or North America or Asia. But interestingly, in this recent paper in Nature, there is a link between the type of feeding, and here are listed the cheese and dairy product feeding, and uh, according to the meat and the salami or prosciutto. And there is change in bacteria and fungi repartition within the commensal flora. And some strains are pointed, some species and strains are pointed to be 
change by the mode of feeding. In the same paper, there is a link established between two types of uh, 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 consequence of feeding on micro microbiota. And indeed, on this part, you have what is called the putrefactive commensal flora, and here the saccharolytic in green. And the saccharolytic is clearly influenced by the production or the non-production of short-chain fatty acid and especially butyrate. And they feeding microbiota and short-chain fatty acid are related. And that is an interesting work showing that according to the type, butyrate, acetate, or propionate, and according to the type of, of uh, population, is a normal population, that is a short stay in a hospital, and that is a long stay in a hospital, and you can see that the change in the short-chain fatty acid production probably influenced by the type of feeding, especially during long stay in hospital. What are the short-chain fatty acid? There are three main acetate, butyrate, and propionate. And these short-chain fatty acids have a lot of function by increasing the mucosal circulation on the level of the colon, especially stimulating sodium and water absorption, etc. But they have also metabolic effect. And indeed, the short-chain fatty acid produced within the colon are partly used locally, but are partly absorbed. And propionate and acetate reach the liver and peripheral organ where there are substrate for glucogenesis and lipogenesis. But more recently, it was pointed the fact that short-chain fatty acid may control some colonic gene expression, modifying several function and especially in terms of uh, intestinal permeability. That means there is again link between microbiota, short chain fatty acid, intestinal permeability, and finally inflammation. And to summarize and having an overview of the relationship between gut microbiota and immunometabolic disease, as mentioned yesterday very brilliantly, there is a view on considering that there is the genetic background, the type of diet, the medication like antibiotic or PPI, and altering the microbiota. And as a consequence, it could have changed in specific uh, stru bacterial strain like Proteasy or Ruminococcus or some other. And that induced change in intestinal permeability leading to endotoxinemia with inflammation, and on the other hand, altered short-chain fatty acid production that influence lipid and glucose metabolism and inflammation. And that is a very important global view, even if we don't know exactly today what are all the players. But one of the most important players is again microbiota, of course, and short-chain fatty acid to induce the so-called, since yesterday, of immunometabolic disease. In summary, the type and mode of feeding may alter intestinal microbiota. It affects the production of short-chain fatty acid, induced change in intestinal permeability and inflammation, and in turn, short-chain fatty acid are influencing glucose and lipid metabolic in the liver. How to modulate the intestinal microbiota when facing or for preventing any disorder? Mimicking the normal intestinal microbiota of breastfed infants, it's logical and may be achieved by several approach. And that is a summary of this very brilliant uh, conf uh, lecture of Mauro Fisberg this morning, and I will not come back on this very fascinating history of dairy product and fermented product. But today, in the current millennium, there is at least three or four approach, the probiotics, the prebiotics, the symbiotics, and the fermentation product. And probiotics are well known as for life and life microorganisms, which when consumed in adequate amounts, confer a health effect on host, etc. It's a WHO definition. And many, many species and strains are known and there could be, and mostly are bacteria, but some are fungi. And the mechanism of action of probiotics are very well known, competition with gut bacteria, acidification, which is a very important issue, and production of different factors, 
in terms of uh, uh, also vitamin and trophic factors. And today, probiotics are recognized, are efficient, and as assessed by meta-analysis in different fields, acute infectious diarrhea, antibiotic-associated diarrhea, necrotizing enterocolitis, intestinal functional disorder. There is no clear evidence in metabolic disorder. But there is another approach, which is prebiotic, which is not bacteria. There are non-assimilable food ingredients that has beneficial effect in human or animals by stimulating selectively one or more bacterial species of the microbiota. And human milk is probably one of the best source of pre, sorry, prebiotics. And what about the fermentation products, which is the topic of today? Many different wording for yogurt. And as mentioned this morning, there is also difference in uh, uh, the, the habit and the culture in consuming uh, dairy products like yogurt. There are many wording, but only one definition, and yogurt is a coagulated milk product that results from fermentation of lactose in milk to lactic acid by two different specific bacteria, Lactobacillus bulgaricus and Streptococcus thermophilus. It's a Codex Alimentarius definition. And as mentioned before by the previous speaker, there seems to have relation between the incidence of type 2 diabetes and the consumption of dairy products and especially yogurt. I will not come back on that. But I would like just to come back on several studies. This one suggesting that the consumption of two, 200 grams of yogurt per day in 30 patients compared to no non-consumer make difference in microbiota in terms of detection of Lactobacillus bulgaricus, enterobacteria level, uh, certain galactosidase activity, and bifidobacteria, which are positively correlated with the amount of fermented milk ingested. And we know very well that bifidobacteria in the microbiota are very important uh, bacterial uh, species. There are also data regarding lactose intolerant subjects in relation with the consumption of yogurt, and that is also an uh, uh, issue for the daily life of some of our, um, uh, in, in the population. And recently it was uh, published a systematic review paper uh, by using many, many databases, and uh, s 61 papers were selected, and all indicated that there are differences in the microbial composition between obese and non-obese patients. And in that paper, the review approached by using probiotics, prebiotic, and diet change. And the result is that growth of bifidobacteria is clearly related with weight reduction, adipogenic effect of diet, intestinal permeability, and inflammation marker. That means modulating microbiota in the popula general population, including the use of and the consumption of yogurt, may influence the microbiota and finally the metabolic disease. And recently, and uh, uh, it was uh, published, a paper uh, suggesting th the use of probiotics, prebiotics, or symbiotics in elderly fecal microbiota. And as you can see, this consumption may change the lactic acid production, acetic, propionic, and butyric acid involving the short-chain fatty acid. Modulating the microbiota may change short-chain fatty acid production and finally the metabolic disease. And probably the next speaker will go on this paper, which is fascinating, nothing to do with metabolic disease, but by consuming yogurt, you may change the emotional response to a woman. And if you compare the, the control group, the placebo, the non-ingestion uh, of yogurt, and those who ingest yogurt, they, there is a difference in the emotional response as shown on the functional MRI. And it's very interesting to make maybe another link between change in emotional behavior and change in fini habit. And in conclusion, I would uh, point the fact that intestinal microbiota may be modulated by probiotics, prebiotics, or fermentation products. 
influencing the immune system, the gut-brain axis, but also the metabolism. And in conclusion, microbiota implementation is crucial as suggested by the microbiota programming. Dysbiosis may be related to disease state like IBD, allergy, IBS, etc. Feeding alters microbiota short-chain fatty acid production and in turn metabolism. Fecal transplantation offers a new approach both in animal and human for supporting the effect of gut microbiota. Short-chain fatty acid, intestinal permeability, and inflammation may act synergically in modifying both glucose and lipid metabolism on the level of the liver and probably the tissue and the adipose tissue. Experimental and epidemiological data have demonstrated links between microbiota, obesity, and metabolic disease. Microbiota modulation may be achieved by using pro, pre, or fermentation product. And I would like just to summarize the importance of this gut microbiota in terms of programming and homeostasy in order to prevent any health disorder. Thank you for your attention.